Hello there. I will be talking about how to critically evaluate epidemiologic studies today. Uh, so the learning objectives really are just to cover the major aspects to think about when you're reading an epidemiological study to help you decide, do you think that the exposure under study actually causes the outcome? And if so, then what should we do about it from a public health perspective? So we're going to be reviewing a lot of things we've talked about over the course of the semester, things like identifying exposure and outcome, looking at what kind of study it is, what the sample was, um, the sampling approach was, how to interpret the results that the authors are summarizing in their article, um, and then going through kind of a checklist just to think about some other attributes that we want to consider when we decide whether or not there might be a causal association, um, and then finally talking about what does it mean from a public health perspective. So from the very beginning of the semester, we uh, talked about what epidemiology is and what it means. We said that it comes from the Greek that really means a study of what is upon the people. Uh, so again, we're looking at the distribution and determinants of health-related states of events. And ultimately, we, we want to use that information to control poor health, to improve health of populations. Um, so in order to do that second step to really apply it, we have to know, do we have good evidence? And so a lot of epidemiology is establishing distribution and determinants and evaluating how strong is the evidence and should we act? And if so, what should we do? Okay, so let's start with thinking about the study design. When we read an article, um, there are a couple things that go into identifying the study design. And the first is making sure you know what the research question is. So as we've talked about all semester, I use the term exposure when we're talking about whatever factor it is, the characteristic um, that we think might cause an outcome. So some people call this the risk factor. Um, I, I will refer to it as the exposure, but those mean essentially the same thing. Uh, that's kind of the independent variable in our analysis. Um, and then the outcome is the dependent variable, the disease, the health outcome, the state of interest. Um, so we might use the term disease or event as shorthand for the health outcome. So making sure you can identify what the exposure and outcome are enables you to determine what kind of study it is. Because as we talked about when we covered study designs, um, one factor that can help you identify the study design is the timing. You know, if it was only a single time point measure, that means it's a cross-sectional study. But if it was done over time, you have to decide whether it was a cohort or case control study. I'm assuming in all of these examples that we're looking at an observational study, not an experimental one. Um, and so in order to do that, you need to distinguish exposure from outcomes. So if people were sampled based on exposure status and were free of the outcome at the beginning, it's a cohort study. If on the other hand, they were sampled by their outcome, by the, their disease status, and then we went back and assessed exposure um, retrospectively, that's a case control study. So knowing what kind of study it is will help you understand potential strengths and limitations of the design, and also better interpret the measures um, that are part of the outcome. Once we've established what they are and know what the study design is, uh, we then want to spend some more time thinking carefully and critically about how did they actually measure and measure exposure and outcome. And these are the characteristics we talked about um, when we talked about the, the measurement properties of different tools. So are they valid, meaning are they likely close to the truth? And are they reliable measures? Can you get consistent results if you ask the same person at multiple time points or if you use different people to rate the same uh, set of experiences, the same observations? So that's that will also uh, feed into your consideration of whether or not you think the exposure truly causes the outcome because if they didn't have a very precise measure or a very accurate measure, then you might say, well, the study doesn't give me convincing evidence that the exposure is causing the outcome because they weren't very well measured. You also want to think about other features of how they collected data, and this could relate to uh, the study design as well. You know, what were the timing of the measures? Again, was it cross-sectional? Was it multiple points in time? Even if there were multiple time uh, points included in the study, they might not be the most relevant ones. So if they're too far apart, 
uh, you might be concerned about that. Or if they're too close together, you might be concerned. So there are still lots of characteristics that you want to think about. Uh, you know, if you are doing a study of pregnancy and birth outcomes, you want to make sure that you are doing your measurements at an appropriate time in pregnancy um, when the exposure is likely to impact the developing fetus. So, you know, if you do it too early on, the, the part of the fetus that you're interested in may not have, may not be going, undergoing um, dramatic changes, and so it might not influence the outcome. Also, if you wait too long in pregnancy, much of the, um, you know, much of the development has already taken place, and so you might not see an impact late in pregnancy either. So you want to think about the timing, whatever mechanism it is you think is underlying this exposure outcome relationship, you want to do your best and make sure that the study authors have done their best to accurately measure the exposure and outcome at the most relevant time point for the research question of interest. Okay, again, you want to think about what what the study design was. I've already talked about this. Uh, I do want to just add one note to this. Typically, because most articles go through a peer review process, the authors will have identified their study design correctly, but um, I have seen a handful of cases over the years and have reviewed a few papers over the years that incorrectly identify the study design. So use the tools that you have, the knowledge you have about how we classify study designs to make sure they're actually talking about it correctly. Typically, the problem I see is that when people have done uh, a survey or something of their population at multiple time points, but it's not the same people over time, so in other words, they're drawing a new sample every time they want to call that a cohort study, but really a cohort study means it is the same individuals being assessed at multiple time points, so that, again, we can look at incidents. And Otherwise, if you're asking different people the same questions at different points in time, that's still a cross-sectional study. You can do multiple cross-sectional studies and report on things like trends, uh, but that doesn't make it a cohort. So that's, that's the, the issue I typically see um, people get confused about, but it's worth taking some time to think about, does your assessment of the study design match up with, with the authors? Okay, so We've looked at what the exposure and outcome are, how the study was designed, how exposure and outcome were measured, and then we want to think about who is included in the study. So uh, typically we identify a population of interest, right, and it might be everyone in a state or country, uh, but we've talked before about the challenges of accurately sampling from within a very large population like that. So a lot of times we end up doing studies on much more narrowly defined populations. So maybe we're looking at adults age 65 and older who have diabetes and it is not well controlled. So that's a very specific subset of the broader population, but it's still an appropriate population to study. And it's important to think about, okay, given that that's our, our intended sample, does our sampling frame accurately reflect all older adults? Um, the, the nice thing in the US about working with older adults is that typically they're Medicare eligible once they reach age 65. And so that's a pretty reliable way to sample older adults. Uh, but there might be instances where people are missed. And certainly with younger groups, it's, it can be more challenging to um, get reliable sampling frames. So think about that when you are reading a paper because you might find uh, for example, that if it's a clinical population, the only people that would be eligible to be included in the study are those who have health insurance coverage or have adequate health insurance coverage that they actually would seek care at that place. And, um, you know, it depends on your provider network and there could be different kinds of people who have different types of health insurance. So using a clinical population as your sampling frame and then saying that it applies to the entire community is probably not entirely accurate. So you want to think about how does the sample included in the study relate back to the population that it is supposed to represent? Does it truly represent everyone in that population or not? Are there people who are likely missed? Then beyond just the sampling decisions themselves, um, the authors may have Im imposed specific inclusion and exclusion criteria. Again, perfectly valid reasons for doing this. Um, you know, you want to make sure that people um, have similar disease states, for example. You know, you might want to, again, narrowly define your population so that 
you are looking only at people, uh, for example, with pregnancy, you might focus on the first pregnancy because we know that there are lots of things that um, once, once a woman has had one pregnancy and a particular outcome, she may be more likely to experience that again. And so if we're looking at risk factors for the outcome, we might wanna focus only on women who are uh, pregnant for the first time or carrying the term for the first time. Um, so that might be part of the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So again, it just helps, especially at the beginning when we come back to the, what do we do with this information from a public health perspective? We wanna make sure we're clear about who the results likely apply to and who they may not apply to. So that when we make decisions about implementing policies and programs, we are not um, creating or exacerbating any existing health inequities or health disparities. Okay, so that was a very quick overview of the major parts of study design that you wanna think about when evaluating whether or not you think there is a causal relationship between exposure and outcome based on a particular study. Let's spend a few minutes talking about interpreting results. So we have covered risk ratios before, relative risk and odds ratio. So this is a reminder that, again, since these are ratios, if the risk of an outcome is identical in both groups, the relative risk will be equal to one, because any number divided by itself is one. Uh, so that's kind of the reference point. That means there's no difference in disease risk uh, based on exposure. Relative risk greater than one means the exposed group has a higher chance of having the outcome. The probability or the risk of the disease or outcome you're looking at was higher for people who had the exposure compared to those who didn't. And then if the relative risk is less than one, that means that the uh, folks who were exposed actually have a lower risk of developing the outcome than people who were not exposed. So we often call this a protective relative risk. And keep in mind, again, that the, the scale for relative risk only goes as low as zero. So zero to 0 0.99 uh, indicates protective effects of the exposure, and then relative risks from 1.01 .01 to infinity indicate uh, actual you know, risk factor that the exposure increases the risk of the outcome. And again, the odds ratio, we interpret essentially the same way. We just say the odds of the outcome is X times as high in the exposed versus unexposed group, uh, but underlying that single word difference is an important distinction in that if the outcome is rare in the population, so uh, if we're looking at something like diabetes or obesity or physical inactivity, um, although those outcomes are pretty common, more than 5% of people in pretty much any population that we'd be studying probably has them, which means the odds ratio is no longer going to be similar to the relative risk. Um, so it's important to consider that when interpreting the results because just because the odds ratio is higher doesn't necessarily mean that the risk is that much higher. Um, that's all I'm gonna say for now. Uh, just keep that in mind when we think about strength of association later. The one new piece of information I wanna mention is survival analysis and how to read and interpret survival curves and hazard ratios. Uh, because this is essentially just a, a type of regression that is commonly used when we have, when we do something like a cohort study, when we have multiple measurements over time. <clears throat> so we have talked before about logistic regression, um, and that's a very useful type of regression approach when you have a single time point to look at the association between exposure and outcome. Uh, but if you want to look over time, this hazard ratio measure is a good one to use. It's commonly used uh, to take advantage of the nature of longitudinal data. So I'll just show you an example here and then we can talk through it. This is actually from uh, some of my work where we were looking at chronic lower limb wounds. And this was from a variety of factors, not just diabetes, although lots of our veterans <clears throat> in the study had diabetes. Uh, we wanted to look at whether outcomes were different for veterans living in rural and urban areas. And so this is an example of the kind of plot that you would get from a survival analysis. Um, often they start at 100% and go down because they really were designed to look at survival. 
Um, and so at the beginning, everyone is alive, and then you're looking at mortality essentially over time, so the lines tend to go down. In this study, we we're actually looking at the cumulative incidence of wound healing was our, um, our outcome. So we followed veterans for a year, veterans who had a chronic wound, we followed them for a year. And so healing is, is kind of a good outcome in this case. And so our scale goes from everyone was non-healed, no one had a healed wound at the beginning, and then by the end you see those curves approach 80%, so the majority of these chronic wounds healed over time. You might also notice that at the beginning here there's a flat line, and that's because, in part, um, we required that they, uh, in order to be a chronic wound, it had to have existed for at least 30 days. So this line actually starts at day 30, but even after that, most of them didn't heal. You know, it took, it took a while after that for, for us to start seeing some wounds heal. So um, kind of a flat line at first, and the solid line represents the rural veterans. The dashed line represents urban veterans. You can see based on the numbers down here, we actually sampled. So this was a cohort study. Oops. We sampled by exposure status, which in this case was rural and urban. So we had the same number of rural veterans and urban veterans by design. None of them, of course, had a healed chronic wound at the beginning. Um, and we followed them, them over, as I said, over a one year period. So you can see just by looking at these lines that they look pretty similar. The rural group actually has, uh, the line is a little higher, which means that they tended to have more wounds healed at any given time point compared to the urban group. And this hazard ratio summarizes that over the curve. So it's saying at any given time point on this line, so let's say at day 100, the hazard ratio for healing was 1.11, which means that rural veterans had about 10% higher chance, higher incidence of wound healing at 100 days compared to urban veterans. And then we'd say the same was true at other time points. So this is, again, this, this hazard ratio kind of averages across all of this difference that we see here. Um, so it does look a little more narrow at the beginning. You know, this hazard ratio, if we calculated it at each time point, might be something more like 1.02, 1.05, and out here it might be closer to 1.2. But on average, rural veterans were about 10%, 11% more likely to have their wound heal compared to urban veterans. So again, looking at the lines, they don't look very different. And this p-value tells us that indeed there was no statistical difference between the two groups. So that's actually good news. We were concerned that rural veterans might um, have less access to care and therefore have longer wound healing times, but we didn't find that to be the case. Uh, we did another analysis with the same data, looking at dual users. So veterans who use both Medicare and VA care for their wound during the study period. And so here you can see very different group sizes because this wasn't our primary aim. We sampled again on rural urban status, but 41 of those veterans in our study used both VA and Medicare and the other 186 did not. And so we saw, we did see a very different result here. Um, you can see these lines are quite a bit farther apart than on the previous slide. And these, this one is not looking at wound healing as the outcome, it's actually looking at amputation risk. Um, so a very negative outcome associated with chronic wounds. Um, and you can see it's uncommon. So only, you know, a couple percent at a year, maybe two or three percent of veterans who had only used VA care had an amputation at that wound site at the end of the year. Um, and for dual users, our veterans who had used Medicare and VA care for their wounds, it was more like 12 or 13 percent. Um, so this hazard ratio that summarizes the difference between these two lines is 8.39. So again, that means that any time during this follow-up period, uh, dual users were on average about eight times more likely to have an amputation than VA exclusive users. Um, and that was statistically significant. <clears throat> so there is a difference between these two lines. And if you're wondering why this uh, dual user line looks so stair-step like. Um, that has to do with the number of people. So essentially this, these curves are showing each day that someone failed, which in this case would be an amputation. Um, every, every time there was an amputation, you see a little line because the, the uh, denominator is changing. The incidence is going up as people 
have amputations. So here, this is a pretty big jump. So this represents more than one person had an amputation at this particular day. I don't know, it looks like maybe 40 or 60 days or uh, probably more like 40 days uh, after the start of follow-up. So that's why it looks a little bit more like a stair step than this, which again, there were just a lot more people. And so it looks a little more like a curve. Okay. Um, so again, the, the take home from that is when you see hazard ratios, they're essentially like a relative risk. You can kind of interpret them the same way. They're just uh, summarizing the difference over time. And just as a reminder, a crude estimate means that they haven't adjusted for anything. Um, and then an adjusted one means that potential confounders were included in the regression models. So any differences observed account for other differences between groups. So I didn't label it on here, but this was adjusted uh, for another, a number of other factors and things like diabetes status and underlying health conditions. Um, a few other things, which I can't remember right now because I didn't put them on the slide, uh, but these are adjusted estimates. Usually we want to focus on those adjusted ones because we don't we want to know does the exposure cause the outcome independent of other things that might be dissimilar between groups. So other than for reasons of confounding, does the exposure cause the outcome? But it can still be informative to look at the crude results uh, to see how those confounding variables might influence that relationship. Uh, statistical significance should be clearly stated in the article p-value less than 0.05 is typical, but there are good reasons to use different cut points. Uh, you might also look at clinical significance or how meaningful it is from a practice perspective, because uh, sometimes we get changes in things that meet a statistical definition of a difference, but in practice, it wouldn't really matter if you know an extra two or 3% of people experienced um, some outcome if the exposure is really uh, difficult to change, let's say. All right, so the last thing we want to come to after we've gone through kind of the technical aspects of uh, reviewing a study and thinking about how well it was done is the public health implications. <clears throat> so the overarching questions again are whether uh, we could have observed the, the observation, the association by chance, and so statistical tests can help us answer that question. Uh, we want to think about whether there's bias that might be at play either from the sample or from failing to fully account for confounding variables. Um, and then finally, we come to that question, do we think there's a cause and effect relationship here uh, that we should act on from a public health perspective? So we can look at um, the measure of association and uh, that gives us some of the information but when we think about, when we make this decision about causality, it's not really an easy yes, no, you know, p-value kind of decision. We have to think about a number of factors. So uh, this is, again, not a, not a hard and fast checklist, but a set of guidelines for additional things to think about. Uh, the first is the strength of the association. So that is going back to the risk ratio or whatever estimate of effect is used in the study and thinking about how big that is. Part of the reason is, you know, if we have an exposure that seems to really substantially contribute to an outcome that's useful, that may encourage action faster, but it's also useful thinking about bias because even if, you know, going back to that dual users being eight times more likely to have an amputation, even if we didn't perfectly account for um, other confounding variables in that analysis, it's unlikely that that relative risk, that hazard ratio would go all the way down to one. Um, you know, so yes, if we, if we left out some important covariates, it may, but in all likelihood, perfectly adjusting for um, confounding probably wouldn't bring that measure of association down to no effect. Uh, so that just gives us more confidence that yes, if we see a really big relative risk, something very far from one, we're more likely to, that, that indicates a stronger association, which means we might feel a little bit more confident in saying that the relationship is causal, assuming all these other pieces are in place. Um, temporal sequence is another one. So this goes back to the study design question. Are we sure that the exposure really came before the outcome? Because if it didn't, then of course, 
there is no causal relationship. Um, and so we want to make absolutely sure when designing studies that the, the order in time, that temporal, that's what temporal sequence means, just time order, that it's correct. Um, so an example is if we want to know about the relationship between uh, opiates, pain medicines, and the risk of falls for older adults, we want to know, does this medication cause older people to fall? Um, if we do a cross-sectional study, that might, that probably wouldn't give us very good evidence for temporal sequence because it's entirely possible, plausible, that someone is prescribed an opiate because they fell. So we want to make sure that they were taking opiates and then fell, not that they fell and then were prescribed opiates. Um, so doing a cross-sectional study where you ask, have you fallen in the past month and have you taken these medications in the past month, that's not going to provide us strong evidence or give us um, a lot of confidence that opiates are causing falls because it very well could be the other way around. Consistency means that we are finding similar things, you know, the relative risk, the risk ratio measure is in the same direction uh, across different kinds of study designs, across different populations in different settings. So again, even if each study individually is imperfect, which uh, almost every study is in some way imperfect, the body of evidence should be coming together to tell the same story. So um, if you get a result that's very different, or if we're not able to replicate results from a really promising early study, then that gives us pause about whether the exposure is truly causing the outcome and that it wasn't some flaw in study design or um, you know, a unique population that the relationship doesn't hold for other groups. In terms of plausibility, we always want to think about whether there's a reasonable mechanism to explain the association. Um, so you, this is basically just saying, is there some reason that the exposure could reasonably be expected to cause the outcome? And I think this is most easily thought about in a kind of biologic mechanism way. You know, if you were looking at a gene mutation and the risk of developing cancer or having a particular birth outcome, then, you know, you could hypothesize a specific pathway that goes through development or cell regulation or something about the cell cycle. Um, but it works just as well for more um, for questions without a biological basis. You know, if we're looking at things like the influence of discrimination or, um, you know, relationship impacts on health outcomes, isolation, those kinds of things, you can still use something like a theoretical model uh, to support a potential mechanism for the association. So plausibility, again, just means is there some mechanism, and it doesn't have to be a biologic one, but some plausible rationale um, evidence to suggest that this exposure truly could cause the outcome. And then the last thing we want to think about, is there ev any evidence of a dose-response relationship? Now, this doesn't always apply, um, but often it's reasonable to think that more of an exposure might cause more of an outcome. So drugs, again, are, are maybe the most obvious way or easiest way to think about dose response. You know, if a medication reduces uh, pain levels, then you would potentially expect that more of that, a higher dose of that medication would reduce pain more. Now, again, that's not always true even with drugs, um, but that's kind of what we mean here. So if you think about something like adverse childhood experiences negatively impacting uh, long-term health outcomes, they have been shown to be associated with lots of different ones. I'll just use mental health as an example, but let's say adverse childhood experiences increase the risk of experiencing depression as an adult. Um, we might want to know, okay, is there a, a graded response to that? You know, if you go from zero to one to two to three to four, do people with four adverse childhood experiences have a greater risk of adult depression than people who had three adverse childhood experiences or two or one? So you can think about ways to structure your data collection so that you can look at different doses so it's not just a dichotomous yes, no, exposed, not exposed. You can think about um, further, finer grades of exposure. And again, that might strengthen the idea that the exposure causes the outcome.
Again, there may be perfectly plausible reasons to think there's a threshold effect or to not expect a dose response, but when it's relevant, that's something you can look for in uh, studies. Uh, I have the falls and opiates example here, just with some more, um, some more comments about temporal sequence. So finally, at the end of this, again, the, the whole point of going through this exercise of deciding whether or not an exposure causes an outcome is primarily to help us decide, should we do something from a public health perspective? Should we change a policy? Do we need to change practice? Should we have additional or different funding streams to address this health issue? Or should we create some recommendations or guidelines from a, a trusted public health body? So we want to use evidence-based public health and this is one component of it, is being able to critically read and evaluate epidemiological studies to help us make these decisions about what should we do from a public health perspective to improve population health. Um, and, you know, sometimes we, we find a relationship and, um, you know, maybe this risk factor, this exposure is relatively small potatoes in the grand scheme that, um, you know, we already have, we already know that some other chemical exposures might be the, the driving causes of a particular kind of cancer. And so, yes, while, um, you know, childhood physical activity contributes to it, it's not a major one. So maybe given the fact that we are always dealing with limited resources in public health, maybe we decide, well, yes, we would like to increase physical activity, but these chemical exposures are much a much bigger um, problem, and so we're gonna focus on those. There might also not be an intervention, um, or it might be really difficult to modify the exposure. Now, that doesn't mean we should ignore it, but that can be the basis for funding additional research to develop interventions or think more creatively about how to modify exposures in order to reduce the risk of the outcome. But again, any of these actions should be on the basis of looking at the existing literature and thinking about, do we have clear evidence of a causal effect before we try to start changing policy practice and funding around the particular exposure? Um, I'm not gonna go through the rest of these slides on bias and error, because we have talked about them before, um, but just a reminder. And I will spend just a second uh, to show this example. This, is, um, this was a study looking at, oh, let me go forward, sorry. Um, amputation again, so lower extremity amputation among people with diabetes, and these are rates in Los Angeles County for people age 45 and older. Um, and so if we look at this map, you can see there's pretty clear geographic variation in amputation rates. And I know not all of you may be from Los Angeles County, but you might know enough to recognize some of these names. Uh, so the lighter blue indicates lower rates of amputation among people with diabetes. So Malibu, uh, Beverly Hills look like they're in this kind of lower range, whereas Compton uh, and some parts of downtown and then the San Fernando Valley in the north have really high rates of uh, amputation compared to those areas. And so, you know, you can think about other factors that might be playing into this. This figure, for example, shows poverty essentially across the county. And you can see that the same areas that tended to have high rates of amputation also tend to have high levels of household poverty. So depending on what your research question is, poverty could be a confounder. It could be the exposure of interest. You could be looking at whether poverty causes amputations directly. Um, you could hypothesize that this has to do with access to care, access to physical activity, fruits and vegetables, other kinds of things. Uh, just a minute, love, that's a bowl. Um, so anyway, the point here is it's important to really do that descriptive epidemiology piece before you jump into analytics so you have a, a clear understanding of your population and what kinds of factors might be at play. And um, at the end, again, you have to make a decision about whether or not there's a causal relationship so you can also help make a decision about whether we should take action from a public health perspective. So in closing, I just wanna remind you to consider all the aspects of a study together. It is a difficult job to make a decision and I don't have a nice clean checklist for you to, to determine whether or not um, an exposure might be causing an outcome and if we should act on it. Um, but just keep in mind, we are constantly making 
uh, choices based on limited resources and we have the potential to do harm even when we're trying to do good. So going through this process, thinking carefully and talking with your colleagues is always a good strategy. Um, and we just, at the end of the day, have to make the best decision we can with the evidence at hand. So that's it. Thank you and good luck as you evaluate epidemiologic studies in the future. Okay.